united with Christ. Meet local churches with open doors serving throughout the Border Valley community and sharing the truth and hope of God's love and salvation. A presentation of Life Christian Broadcasting Television. And now, United with Christ. Hello, it's great to be with you again today on Good Friday, the end of Lent 2021. I think it's a great time for us to focus on the cross and the message of the cross and how the cross should define our lives and our thinking. The cross, not culture, should define how we think and live. I want that to settle in. I'm going to say it again. The cross, not culture, should define how we think and how we live if we call ourselves Christians. You know, if we are Christians, everything we are is because we believe in the cross of Christ, in his death and his resurrection. And this is what defines our lives. Think about the cross, the center of the story of Scripture, the whole story of Scripture leading to this climax. Jesus, God's one and only Son, sent to save us from God's wrath. That's hard to think about sometimes. We forget about God's wrath. It's holy and just. We can't explain it. It just is. Yes, he's a God of love, but he's also a God of wrath. And his design and plan was to send his only son to an ugly cross to save us from his wrath. Wow. We can't explain it, but Jesus did it. He took on the sin, my sin, and the sin of all humanity. So think about this horrible, violent moment in history happened. God designed it. It happened. God willingly went to the cross. But then he, we read in Second Peter where he says, Peter writes, He, God, is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. He created this moment because he wants relationship with us, the cross, the violent cross. His son died there. And yet he says, I'm patient with you because I don't want you to perish. I want you to come to me, to come to repentance. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing when we can really come to terms with that. Jesus wrestled with this call in the garden. Remember, we read about it in the stories in the scripture. In the garden, he sweat drops of blood and he cried out to his father, let this cup pass from me. He did not want to go to the cross. Think about it. He did not want to do it. But then in the end, he says, not my will, but yours. So he surrendered his will to death on a cross. That's what Jesus did for us. The cross changed everything. Every single person, every one of us here today, every person around the globe must decide what to do with the cross. And for we Christians, people who are Christ followers, this kind of love, the kind of love that would, that would cause God to die for my sins, that is, that's love, folks. That kind of love, it requires something of me. We can't just simply say, oh, yeah, he died for me. He died for me, and then just go on living life the way we want to live. No, this kind of love, the cross, demands something of us. We're going to talk about that today. In fact, Jesus himself says in Matthew 16, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. This is discipleship on Jesus' terms, taking up your cross and following me. So self-denial, serving others. That's what Jesus did, right? When he was going to the cross, it was for you and me. No self-promotion or self-interest. He was God in the flesh. He didn't say, I'm God, I don't have to do this. He humbled himself and did it. Unlimited forgiveness. Renouncing status concerns. This is the cross. This is discipleship on Jesus' terms. It is completely opposite of our cultural way of thinking. And folks, we need to, we need to think always, like daily. I hope you spend time daily in the scripture and with God because it's a daily thing that we need to wrestle with and make sure that the world 
and the world's philosophies and the world's ideas are not seeping into our mind and the way we think and the way we see things. No, we need to see things through the cross and through scripture. Christian thinking must always be defined by the cross. Let's think about that in some practical terms. What are some cultural ways of thinking today, right now in our 2021 culture, this wokeness that they talk about? You know, I think about that and I think it's like, who's the biggest victim? So victimhood is a, is a status thing right now. Like if you are a person of a certain color and a certain sex and, and you know, a certain status, then you have the biggest victimhood so you can blame everybody else. That's cultural thinking. Being offended at everything is a cultural thought, you know. Um, saying, I'm born this way. God made me this way. I'm born this way. That's cultural thinking. Serving myself, promoting myself. That's cultural thinking. What, what would those things look like if we say, okay, what does the cross thinking look like? Well, we just read some of it a minute ago. But how about unlimited forgiveness, right? We're not holding offenses. We're not being offended. We're not saying, oh, I'm the worst victim on earth because I'm this, this, and this. We are forgiving, forgiving, forgiving. That's what the cross did for us. So that's what's required of us to be unlimited on our forgiveness. How about humility and preferring others above ourselves? Not thinking more highly of ourselves than we should. Renouncing our status to be like Jesus. After all, Jesus renounced his status, status as God and, and became human flesh and went to the cross. So we renounce our status in, to be like Jesus. We learn to serve others. This is cross thinking. The cross, folks, should define the way we think and act as Christians. I want to read out of Philippians 2. I think it's beautiful the way Paul wrote it. In Philippians 2, he says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if you have any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. You know, the culture's talking so much these days about racism. Racism is a sin. Racism is the opposite of humility, right? We think we're better than somebody else or we don't like somebody because of the color of their skin. But right here, no, we are to be humble and value others above ourselves. We are not to look to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. This is what defines us, folks. Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. This is the message of the cross. Death, death to ourselves, death to my ways, and life to God's ways. So the message of the cross is humility, sacrificing yourself, putting on the likeness of Christ. This is what the cross requires of me. Not this idea in our culture that, oh, God made me this way, and God is love, and nothing else. And, oh, God just wants you to be happy. No, God doesn't just want you to be happy. God wants you to be righteous righteous in his eyes. These are shallow false narratives. These, you know, God wants you to be happy and, oh, God is, loves me, you know, and, and he doesn't care about anything else and God made me this way. Those are shallow false narratives. And it's like Satan in the garden when he said to Eve, oh, did God really say that? Yeah, he really did say that and it's for your own best interest, right? So again, I want us to remember we're talking about the cross today and how the cross should shape our thinking and our, our living in our culture today. We hear a lot today in our culture on justice, equality, and reconciliation. 
But sadly, none of it I hear is inside a framework of the cross. In fact, everything I hear, you know, out in culture is outside the framework of the cross. And outside the cross, it's never going to work because it's our own human efforts and our human efforts always fail. True justice, equality, and reconciliation can never happen outside the cross. We know this. We, God's people, should know this better than anyone else because we have the word of God that informs us, you know, and informs us what the cross looks like and how we should be thinking and living. I want us to look in Romans chapter 5 because, you know, first we are reconciled to the cross. Then once we are reconciled to the cross, our job is now to become reconcilers for God and to reconcile people to Jesus. And we're going to see that in Romans 5. Um, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Now, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners... That's powerful, people. While we were sinners, before we were perfect, while we were still messed up, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him, through Jesus? So right here, Romans 5, we are saved from God's wrath through what Jesus did on the cross. For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. So it's the cross of Christ. It's through Jesus and what the work he did on the cross that we are reconciled to God. Everything falls away when we come to God and turn to him. And then it, so it's through the through the cross, and then we're going to read in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to continue reading. I didn't type this part out. Now that we've been reconciled to Jesus through the cross, we become reconcilers. Starting in verse 11, this whole passage from 11 through 20, I'm not going to read it all. I'm going to just pick some of it, but you can read it. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade men. So it's our job now to go out and persuade people of the message of the cross and how beautiful it is. True justice, equality, and reconciliation come through the cross. So it's up to us to try to persuade men. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So we live for Jesus now. Now skip down to verse 18. All of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against him. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. So we've been reconciled to God and now we are, he's committed to us to be reconcilers. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. Wow, we have a job to do, church, and our culture right now needs us more than ever. They need the truth and the message of the cross where true freedom, justice, equity, and reconciliation come. I want us to read also uh, in Ephesians, a couple of pages over, chapter 2, because it's also through the cross that barriers, racial or otherwise, are broken. And justice happens. Um, one verse here in, in Ephesians chapter 2, the header on the top of the paragraph in my Bible says, One in Christ. And it's really here where Paul is writing about this multi ethnic family now, because what Jesus did on the cross broke down the barriers, and we are now one family in Christ, Jew and Greek alike. But I could say all colors of the world alike. We are now one in Christ. So, this whole heading, it starts in verse 11, verse 11 through 20. I'm going to read just little bits here. He himself is our peace who has made the two one. So he's writing here about Greeks and Gentiles, these two separate worlds. Because in the, you know, in the world at that time, that's basically how it was seen. There's the Jews and there's everybody else out here, the Gentiles. 
Um, but he's made the two one, and he's destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. And in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. So there's no more hostility between men, women, when we come to Christ, we are all one in Christ. The barriers are broken down. It's in Christ. It's in the cross of Christ that we have unity with our fellow brothers and sisters. And it's also through the cross that we are seen equal through God's eyes. Also, I'm going to read, just turn a page back over in Galatians chapter 3, um, verse 28. This reiterates just what I read in Ephesians. There is therefore... Neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Again, it's through what Christ did on the cross that we are reconciled. This is where we see true justice, equality, and reconciliation happen. Someone said it this way. I heard this and I've, I liked it. The cross is our social order. And that's so true for we Christ followers. The cross is our social order. We died to ourselves. We serve others. We forgive always, no matter how many times we need to forgive. You know, in today's culture, it seems like the culture is looking for somebody to blame. And right now, you know, it's the white man and the white supremacy and it's whiteness. You know, you have to repent of your whiteness. I can't repent of my whiteness because God made the color of my skin. I can only repent of my sins. That's what we repent of is our sins not the color of our skin. None of us can have any control over that. We can't pay the price for our own sin. Jesus already paid the price for our sin. So we need to make sure when we're involved in culture that we don't let the deceiving lies of culture infiltrate our mind and shift the way we think. We need to stay, like I've said in the recent past, we need to stay so rooted and established in the truth of God's word that we immediately know the lies of culture. And we can say, no, that's not what God says. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1 that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. And this is so true. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It is so true. If we are outside, think of it how you were before you knew God, before you understood the truth, before you lived in the way of the cross. It seemed like foolishness to you. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the intelligent, intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believed. And what was preached, if you continue reading this whole passage in 1 Corinthians 1, was Christ crucified. That's what was preached, Christ crucified, Christ and that cross. And yes, to the world then in Corinth and to our world now, it's foolishness. It's, it's, it doesn't make any sense. But we know that the cross is not foolishness. We know that he who was on that cross is alive and seated at the right hand of God. And, and in that is wisdom. So are you going to choose the wisdom of the culture or the age? You know, and it could be at any age we lived, really. It was the same in Corinthians where he was writing this passage I had just read from. The wisdom of the age, the wisdom of culture, or the wisdom of God. Which one are you going to choose? The cross should inform how we as Christians choose. You know, again, I, I keep hashing these things out, but I want to make sure that we understand, you know, cultural ideas that are lies. Like abortion. Let's take abortion. We think that, you know, that needs to be legal and it's the right thing to do. But abortion is murdering a life that God has formed, that God knows we don't give that life the ability to multiply its cells and be formed into a human being. That's God who's doing that. God is the one who gives life. We might have made a mistake and gotten pregnant out of wedlock, as happens. That doesn't mean now that we should have the right to go take the life 
that God is forming inside of our womb. No. Instead, we repent of our sins and we turn to God and we say, God, help me. Help me to raise this child that you are forming in the knowledge of you. So that's the wisdom of the world versus the wisdom of God. It could be same-sex marriage. It could be the gender is a cultural construct. Just a couple of days ago, CNN, a CNN reporter said that there is no precedent for assigning sex at birth and nobody really knows what babies are when they're born. Can you believe that? We don't believe that. That is not true. We know how boys and girls are different and how they're formed and God has declared it in the scripture. So we don't let cultural's, culture's ideas come and shape us. No, we let God and the cross, humility, on and on it goes. How about easy divorce and living together before you're married, sex outside of the boundaries of marriage, on and on it goes. The wisdom of the culture is always, you know, First John 2, uh, he, he said, the, everything in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Everything, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is of the world. So if you can define things by, is, if, am I lusting after that in my flesh? Am I lusting after that with my eyes? You know, something I just want so badly. Is it pride in my life? All of that is from the world. If those things shape how we think about things, it's from the world. It's not from the cross. The cross, in fact, is a stumbling block to these ideas. But Christian thinking, again, must be rooted in the cross. Not a secularized uh, not a Christianized version of secular wisdom, but true wisdom from God's word. The cross, the power of God for we who are being saved or foolishness to those who are perishing. The reason we can preach about the wisdom of the cross is because the one who hung on the cross is alive, again, like I said, and seated at the right hand of God and praying for us always. There's a beautiful song. It's an old song, an old hymn written with a new chorus. I'm gonna read the lyrics to you. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them through his blood. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love, flow mingled down. Did ever such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were an offering far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Oh, the wonderful cross, oh, the wonderful cross, bids me come and die and find that I may truly live. Oh, the wonderful cross, the wonderful cross, all who gather here by grace draw near and bless your name. Again, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Following Jesus requires us to live with the cross in focus in our thinking and our actions like Jesus. If you're watching today and you happen to not know Jesus, you're not following Jesus, or maybe you've drifted away and you're not following him as you should, you're thinking more like the world than the cross, you can make that right today. It's so easy. God is always waiting. He wants us in relationship with him, and it's so easy to turn back to him. All you have to do is confess with your mouth. You confess, first of all, that he is Lord, that you believe he is who he said he is, the Son of God, and that he died for your sins. You confess that. And then you confess and repent of your sins. You say, God, I am a sinner. I have sinned. You can name them out if you want to, but you can say, please forgive me of my sin, and I denounce them, and I am today turning from my sin and turning to you. And I want your cross, oh God, to shape my life and to shape my thinking. That's, that's all you need to do. And then you believe in your heart that he has done it. You believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. 
That's all you need to do. Confess, repent, and believe. You do need to do a couple more things. You need to get into church. You need to be in a local fellowship that is a solid biblical church teaching the principles of the word of God and helping you grow in your walk with Christ. You need to do that. In fact, you can call Harvest Christian Center and you can say, hey, you know, I prayed to turn from my sins and to ask Christ into my life and I want to know more. We have a class that meets on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock upstairs. It's a new believers class, and it takes you through the principles of being a new believer in Christ and really establishes you in that way so you know how to walk in the way of Christ. Um, you need to be, if you, if you decide to come to Harvest, well, you need to come to church regularly and be part of the fellowship here and get to know others in community because that is how we grow best in our walk with Christ. We are part now of the body of Christ. He's our head, we're his body. So we need to come together. The body, you know, the foot can't be a foot over here all by itself. It needs to be part of the body of Christ in fellowship. That's how we learn to be more Christ-like and to grow. Sometimes, you know, we get crossways with each other in the body of Christ. But when we're in fellowship in the right way with the body of Christ, we learn that we have to come and talk and maybe forgive and, and repent and confess and work that out and stay in fellowship in that body of Christ. There are many rooms all across this city. Maybe you live too far from Harvest Christian Center or, or we're not quite your style. That's okay. Get into a good, solid, Bible-believing church where you can learn and grow in your walk with Christ and get in community in church there so you can know what it means to be in fellowship with the body of Christ. Because there's a lot of different rooms, but we're all part of his body. You can also call KSCE TV today and tell them that you've accepted Christ in your heart. And I want to pray with you as we go today. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for every person who can hear my voice and is watching today. You know where they are. Lord, I pray first for any that are not following you that have made this decision today to lay down their own selfish ways and pick up your cross. Lord, I pray that you will help them in that, that your spirit will be there with them, Lord, and help transfer them into the new person with determination to follow you with everything they have in them, Lord, that they could put aside their old habits and ways, that you'll help them find a church where they can be plugged into the body of Christ and grow in their walk with Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray for my fellow brothers and sisters all across this city, that you will help us to be unashamed of the gospel of Christ, that you will help us to stand up in this culture we live in and in love speak the truth, Lord, not being ashamed of the truth, no matter what people will try to do, no matter how they will try to destroy our lives, that we will stay firm and established in who you are, God, and who you've made us to be, that our lives will look more and more like you and the shape of the cross and less and less like us. We thank you for what you did on the cross, Jesus. Thank you for saving our souls. We look to you. We thank you, and in Jesus' name we pray. God bless you today.